Okay, I wanna give Phil as much time as possible for his incredible lecture, so I'll get started. It is a huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Philip Fisher, um, who is the Excellence in Learning Endowed Professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University, where he serves as the founding director of the Stanford Center on Early Childhood, one of my favorite topics. Um, his highly impactful research focuses on developmental neuroscience um, in relation to early life adversity, supporting community-based early childhood systems to ensure that all children thrive from the beginning of life, and developing tools and identifying pathways to accelerate the pace of early childhood research. Um, Dr. Fisher is particularly interested in prevention and programs improving children's functioning in areas such as relationships with caregivers and peers, socio-emotional development, and academic achievement. And he's the developer of a number of widely implemented evidence-based interventions for supporting healthy child development, especially in the context of social and economic adversity including the treatment foster care at Oregon for preschoolers, uh, kids in transition to school, kids, and the filming interactions to nurture development. And on a personal note, um, his work with some of the most foundational discovery um, and policy oriented framing that inspired my career and uh, continues to influence my work today. So it's great to have him here with us so I can learn more about what I should be doing next. Um, Dr. Fisher is also currently the lead investigator on the ongoing Rapid EC project, which is a national survey on the well being of households with young children. He's published over 200 empirical papers and peer reviewed journals and is the recipient of the 2012 Society for Prevention Research and Translational Science Award and a 2019 Fellow of the American Psychological Society. He's well known for his kindness, generosity of spirit, and for prioritizing what truly matters in the work more often than not, the children and communities that are supporting them. Thank you for coming here. Well, it, it's a pleasure to be here for a, a number of reasons. First, this is probably the closest to where I live that I've given a talk in a long time. I live here in the city and commute down to Stanford. So there's that. Also, I think I met Nikki when you were a graduate student at the University of Washington and I might've had like my very first grant. So been like in the same orbit for a very long time. So it's, it's just a pleasure to be here and get to see your work environment and get to know your colleagues. Um, I, I have a fair amount of content to get through, um, but I hope you'll find it engaging. Um, so why don't we just go ahead and dive right in. Um, so I just want to set up what I'm going to be talking about. This is probably familiar to everybody. This is the so-called Heckman equation or Heckman curve. I, I, I just I think it's important to start by acknowledging that in recent years, there has been uh, a widespread acknowledgement, not just in the scientific community, but in the general public, of how critical investments in early childhood are and the extent to which these investments really pay dividends, where the, the largest return on, on investments come from social programs and other programs, health related, um, that focus on early childhood. Um, I think, in part of um, of that sort of growth of understanding amongst not just science, uh, but policymakers and the general public, there's really been a proliferation of programs, of efforts to support uh, young children. And I think more importantly, as we'll be talking a lot about over the course of the, the, the next few minutes, um, the adults in the lives of young children. And yet, in spite of these investments and in spite of the proliferation of programs, at least uh, some ways that the field has been characterized um, would suggest that we're not making the kind of progress that you'd expect to make with all of this attention and resources dedicated. So this is a slide that shows the results of a meta-analytic uh, study. Uh, this one in particular uh, is a paper published by Greg Nutkin and Catherine Magnuson showing the effect sizes over time from the very early seminal programs in early childhood, peri preschool, uh, abecedarian, um, and then subsequent um, large scale, what are often referred to as omnibus early childhood programs and the effect sizes. And what you can see largely here, just as the, the primary takeaway or point that I wanna make is that there hasn't really been an increase in the impact of these large scale omnibus kind of multi-component programs over the many years since the 1960s when some of these programs began. As a result of that, and also um, as a result of what Nikki referred to, which is um, that over the years, I and my colleagues and a number of other people have spent a lot of time and effort uh, developing, evaluating using RCTs and then um, implementing and attempting to scale 
uh, programs in early childhood that we haven't seen the kind of uptake or the kinds of, of transformations. And, and we've thought a lot about why that might be the case. Um, and really this led us about 10 years ago to, to really kind of look to restart how we were thinking about our programmatic work to support young children and adults in their lives. Um, since I've, I've transitioned to Stanford a couple of years ago, I now have learned that these the things that we have done in the context of this work are described as design principles because Stanford, Stanford is big on design. Um, but we've really thought about sort of four primary ways that we might be able to move the field of early childhood forward in particular around the ways to support the adults in the lives of young kids and kids themselves. Uh, the first principle is gonna take probably the most time to get through. It's not lengthy, but there's that, that's where probably the most content is. Um, so I think, you know, I mentioned that a lot of the programs that have focused on early childhood historically, especially ones that have had large scale federal funding have been omnibus programs. I think one of the things that we thought about as we experienced uh, implementing programs that we had developed uh, up in Oregon was that it was really complicated and expensive to implement these kinds of programs. You needed a whole team of people, somebody to work with the parents, somebody else to work with the kids. Programs were lengthy. Uh, they took, they, they often, in the case of the ones that we developed, would take uh, a year or more of intervention time, sometimes shorter, um, but they were just complicated uh, and I think that was one of the issues. And so one of the things that we started to think about was if you can get to kind of what the building blocks of healthy development are, if you can isolate in the context of early relationships, what it is that's the primary driver or mechanism of how children develop or uh, how development might get off course, even in the context of what you might consider adaptation, uh, and you focus on those specific mechanisms. It might streamline the process. You might uh, still be able to have impact uh, and you might also be able to, to be more effective at scaling these programs uh, because they're more straightforward and kind of ha can have the, the kind of uptake that I think we'd like to see with Fidelity. Um, I, I was trained largely in a social learning environment. Um, it was at a time when um, there was a huge battle between attachment theory and social learning theory. I'm happy to say, because I think many of us at that time thought we're really using different language to describe very similar phenomena, um, that there is a confluence of ideas about what is at the core of healthy development. And so really what we started to think about in the context of our work was what is it in the early relational context that drives children's development and in particular, you can choose your language, but the idea of responsive, sensitive caregiving, uh, predictable, contingent caregiving, all of these things seem to really be at the core. The extent to which the child grows up in an environment in which they're nurtured, in which there, there can be patterns that are detected of uh, action and, and reaction. These are really the things that, that across all of these scientific sort of lenses we see as driving children's well-being. How did we come to this? Uh, this is sort of where I dive in a little bit deeper. I think the work that we did, I, I understand that Megan Gunner was here recently, so you may have heard her talk about this, and Nikki has done a lot of work in this area, that if we look at what happens in the absence of these things that we've said are really critical, we see even at a biological level, not just a behavioral or psychological level that things can get off track. So um, one of the things that many of us have been looking into for quite some time is the extent to which the stress in our endocrine system, and in particular, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is shaped by early relationships and is really critical. Those relationships are critical for the system to develop typically. The work that we did in this area involved studying children in the US foster care system, very young children. And in particular, and this was at a time when uh, sort of doing biomarker research was, was oftentimes quite cumbersome um, and ethically challenging, especially in the context of high adversity populations. Um, but we were able to sample saliva and um, we were looking at the, the diurnal release patterns of salivary cortisol across the day. Um, and really our, what we found at this time was that 
in contrast to the typical pattern that you see in children and adults, which is at elevated levels around 30 minutes after awakening that diminish rapidly and are virtually um, non-existent at bedtime. And compared to uh, individuals experiencing acute stress at a particular time. So uh, for example, at the onset of the pandemic, or if there's a forest fire, the kinds of things people going through a divorce, you'd expect to see elevated cortisol across the day. What we found in the foster children that we were studying was blunted cortisol in the morning that remained low throughout the day. And this was a conundrum for us until what one of the things that we realized in connection with collaborators like Megan Gunner and others who are studying children reared in institutional environment or orphanages in other countries was that the thing that children in foster care and children in these institutional contexts shared in terms of their experience was the lack of consistent and predictable and nurturing input. And so the absence of expected care, especially given that adults really help to buffer infant stress levels and neuroendocrine systems early in life turned out to be, at least in our thinking and, and that of many others, one of the things that might lead to the downregulation of this system because it's metabolically costly to mount this, this cortisol response. And so what we were seeing really was an adaptation to a non-responsive early environment. Um, and again, uh, there have been uh, many others who have, who have picked up on this. I think the, the, what's important to keep in mind here is that whereas typically we think about adversity and maltreatment as bad things to happening to kids, this particular area of research indicates that the absence of supportive nurturing early care also can be a so-called toxic stressor and impact children with implications across the lifespan. It's not just the stress in our endocrine system. Um, another example, again, from some of our early work in foster care, this is a collaboration with Jen Martin McDermott, Jackie Bruce, uh, and Nathan Fox. Uh, we looked at the extent to which we might see uh, actual brain activity in response to laboratory paradigms altered also uh, by the experiences of, of unpredictability and neglect that we saw in many foster kids. Um, and again, we, we, we sort of started down this route, not because we were kind of like brain researchers and really wanted to characterize these things. We started on this path because we were clinicians and we wanted to understand the phenomena that we are observing in foster children once they were removed from a not as positive environment and placed either in a foster home or their parents dealt with whatever issues and they were placed back at home. Why was it that these children behavior, social, emotional function and cognition seemed to be different? Um, and so we really wanted to characterize some of these systems to be able to understand what we might be seeing at a behavioral level. So uh, in this particular test, this is my son, Henry, at about age four. He's now 25. He's six feet five. So it doesn't look like this anymore, but I like to look at this picture. Um, we measured electrical activity uh, using uh, event-related potentials. I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but basically if you have an electrode cap, um, you can measure electricity, electrical activity on the surface of the scalp that corresponds to activity uh, in brain regions that underlie those areas. Um, and if you then use tasks where you're repeating uh, the same action again and again, you can do an average of the amount of electrical activity in all of these different areas. One of the things that's noteworthy and that Nathan and Jen had, had been studying for a while is the extent to which when these tasks are being performed, if an individual makes an error, there's an increase in electrical activity, in particular in the frontocentral region, uh, in response to making that mistake. Uh, it's called the error-related, or uh, yeah, error-related uh, uh, activity, and the amount of activity that we see is directly corresponding to the extent to which individuals uh, kind of make this error. Now, the the error-related negativity that we were seeing. Uh, we wanted to test in, in foster kids because they didn't seem to be particularly responsive to when they were making a mistake. So it gave them this task called the flanker task. Um, this is a, a one that's partic particularly designed for young children, um, but basically the instructions are that you're gonna see a white dot that comes on the screen and you're gonna see some colored circles that appear uh, above the white dot. Um, as you could see from Henry, he was holding a button box that had a red button and a green button. So the instruction is, is just to push the button on the button box. It's the same color 
as the circle that's above the white dot. And we give them some opportunity to practice. Um, the, on the left, what you can see are these congruent trials where all the colors are the same. It's easier for kids to do that. They tend not to make very many mistakes. The one on the right, these incongruent trials, and the reason that this is called the flanker task is because there are different colored circles that are flanking the one in the middle. Kids typically, and adults, on these kinds of incongruent trials take longer and are more prone to making mistakes. And so then the question became, would we see as much of the error-related negativity in the foster kids when they made a mistake. Uh, we did a comparison of kids from demographically similar backgrounds. So we sampled low-income community children. And indeed, what you can see here on the left-hand side is that we saw this kind of uh, error-related negativity. In this task, we also, because they're young children, show them either a smiley face or a frowny face after the response. Um, because that we're, we want them to know whether they absolutely made a mistake or not. And so here you can see the feedback related negativity um, that you'd expect to see. In contrast, um, and if this was in a class, I would ask you to tell me what's different about this, but I'll just give the answer away. So what we saw in the, in the young foster children was no feedback related negativity. So they were making mistakes and we didn't see any change in the amount of electrical activity in that frontocentral region which is interesting given that we were also seeing in classroom situations and reported by the foster parents um, that there wasn't um, much response when kids got corrective feedback. Um, I will just tell you uh, that there's a happy ending to this story, which is that in the context of the more comprehensive and intensive programs that we developed, we actually saw young kids develop this feedback related negativity response um, after getting a lot of cues in classroom and home-based situations when they were doing the right things um, and non-punitive corrective feedback when they, were, when they were making mistakes. So there is a lot of plasticity in these systems. I'm not gonna talk a lot about what we found in those areas, but many people, including Nikki here, have found that these systems can respond to improved environmental circumstances, especially when it's the relational environment around them. Um, it's not just uh, neuroendocrine functioning. It's not just uh, brain activity. Um, we see many other ways in which the underlying biology and neurobiology of children is affected by these kind of non-responsive early environments. This is a collaboration with Pat Levitt um, where we found oxidative stress um, uh, really is, is something that has to do with altered metabolic function. Um, as something that would that has also uh, directly corresponds to the amount of adversity kids have experienced, and again, a, a number of um, of studies done by colleagues here at UCSF about changes in the underlying neurobiology that we see um, in response to to these kinds of stressors. Um, one thing that I want to be really clear about, because I think, especially in psychiatry, in my field, clinical psychology, I think we tend to, to, to sample oftentimes from the kind of extreme experience end of the continuum. So a lot of our early work was in foster care um, or uh, in other kinds of very stressful environments or kids adopted post-institutionally. Um, but I think it's a really important to consider the extent to which adversity uh, occurs along a continuum. And in particular, one of the things that we're seeing now in the aftermath of the pandemic, many people um, who had ongoing research studies that included sampling biomarkers were able to look at even in less, less adverse kinds of, of circumstances, the extent to which the experiences of, of unpredictability in an ongoing way that was born of the pandemic may have impacted uh, underlying stress neurobiology and other systems. And we continue to see these effects. So I think this is important because as we turn from things like maltreatment or neglect um, to poverty, to the effects of structural and systemic racism, we still see the potential for some of these alterations or adaptations to occur. And so we shouldn't just be thinking about these approaches for the extreme end of the continuum, but really we should be thinking about them from the phenomenology that we observe in clinic, uh, in the context of pediatric care uh, and other kinds of contexts um, where, where there may be less, uh, less extreme adversity, but we're still seeing some of those effects. So the design principle that our first kind of uh, focal uh, area was on was really thinking about 
this interactional space of contingent, responsive, uh, sensitive parenting as something that we should primarily prioritize. Um, the second had to do with the fact that um, many of the approaches that we invoke when we're developing strategies to support adults who work with young children or who are parents of young children um, don't really take advantage of the extensive amount of knowledge about what are the circumstances under which adult learning is most likely to occur. And so we can design some of our strategies in ways that help us understand how to parse information and in particular, how to introduce information that doesn't arouse a lot of sufficient amount of negative affect to prevent people from really being able to make use of it. Uh, so the science of adult learning is another uh, design principle that we've really um, focused on. We've moved away from what everybody is tempted to do in early childhood, which is just to explain to people what's typical development and have them learn about that. Um, we know that we do better with adults when we enhance existing skills. And again, as I said, if we really endeavor to limit the amount of negative arousal that the intervention strategies uh, involve, we think that, that that in and of itself can go a long way. The third design principle um, is that when you think about these, these basic phenomena or building blocks of healthy development that occur in the relational space, I think there's a, a tendency to think about them in, in temporal terms that are much longer than they typically occur in. So we'll be thinking about how over a span of the first months of a child's life, the, the nature of these kinds of interactions might be shaping things. However, if you really zero in, a lot of the interactions that we're talking about occur in very brief bursts of interaction between adult and child. And in many instances, in fact, and we learned this from those who helped us understand the importance of using video, they can occur over a period of just two or three seconds. And so when you're thinking about, well, how do you build an intervention around these basic building blocks, but the phenomena that you're talking about are micro-social or very brief in nature, then you need to figure out ways to be able to show people what those things are because they go by almost too quickly to process. Uh, and just talking about them again is not a particularly useful tool. Um, so uh, again, when we started the redesign process, one of the things that we had been hearing about for many years was using video coaching as an effective tool. We had colleagues in uh, Scandinavia who were big fans of this approach. Um, we had them come over uh, to the US and do some training. And, um, and we were really quite taken by the extent to which using video to show people what they're already doing was really transformative in nature. Um, we were, there were a number of other aspects of this that I think were quite remarkable in terms of what we observed. I'll be happy to talk about them, but I think it's, it's helpful to get into some of the design of what we created um, to help illustrate them. And I do want to be clear, there are many video coaching approaches that are out there. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is ours. Uh, I can talk about the distinction between ours and some of the others. Um, but these all really are kind of like parts of, of the family tree of how you use uh, video collected in the natural environment to show people actions and activities in which they're engaged and interactions in which they're engaged with their child um, to, really, uh, to really facilitate positive development. Um, the last design principle, um, we have historically been really bad as a field at thinking about uh, effective approaches that can scale. Um, I, and I, it's interesting, again, now being in an in a, uh, academic environment where there's a whole sort of entrepreneurial emphasis, not just in the business school, um, I've really come to see that in num many other fields, the idea starts with how do we develop something that could scale, something in which there would be mass interest, in which there would be revenue streams that would help to pay for it, where we think about the user experience and so forth. Um, and in that context, the idea of does it work, does, is it actually impactful, is secondary. And oftentimes sort of gets relegated to, well, we'll figure that out once we have a marketable product. I think in our fields, what we've done is to say, we'll, we'll first develop something and determine that it's effective, and then we'll scale it. 
And so the scalability is relegated to an afterthought. And one of the things that that means is that if you don't design kind of for both of these from the get-go, at some point, you're going to run into roadblocks. And actually, even with the approach that we've taken, uh, which we thought was incredibly scaled back and, and designed to really for widespread implementation, we've still run into barriers. So I just want to say like that's a potential threat slash risk in terms of how I think when, when you come from a background where evaluating whether things are working or not is privileged, then the question of can it actually be effective at a, in, on a large scale basis is something that we, we have not given enough attention to. So out of these uh, various design principles, these four, was born this program, which uh, we called FIND. FIND stands for Filming Interactions to Nurture Development. We even have a cute logo. Um, and again, the, the concepts uh, behind FIND are very basic, parsimonious, and straightforward. Uh, we often use the metaphor of serve and return that was developed by the Frameworks Institute and the Harvard Center on Developing Child National Scientific Council um, as a way, as a metaphor to help people understand what we're talking about. And in particular, and this is quite important, serve and return, I think, sort of in the vernacular is like any interaction between adults and, and children. We have come to define it as part of the development of this model as instances in which the child is exploring the world, is doing something, looking at something or saying something, uh, and the adult notices and responds. So it always begins with the child in the context of this particular uh, program. Uh, we also, the other kind of very parsimonious uh, aspect of this approach is just to emphasize waiting, um, that adults are oftentimes so anxious to engage with the child that they don't give the child enough time to really respond. I see this with my grandkids, um, where they're, they're now their language is developing. And if you ask them a question, uh, you're, you'll be tempted to respond for them or ask them something else before they formulated the response. It just takes them a while to get the words out. So the idea of waiting to see what the child does is another big piece of this. Um, again, in the development of the program, what we decided we needed to do was not just emphasize these serve and return moments, but really deconstruct the moments into component parts. Um, and these, again, these are not rocket science. You, I'm sure you've heard of these, regardless of whether you're familiar with FIND, because they're very common in clinical and in kind of early childhood research. Um, so the first, the first element that we focus on is sharing what the child is looking at or sharing their attentional focus. Um, the next one is any kind of response that the adult makes that lets the child know that the adult sees and hears and understands them. It can be verbal or nonverbal. The third uh, element is naming, and that's just a subcategory of support and encouragement where the adult uses words to describe the child's behavior, actions, or emotions. And then the last two are sort of extensions of these core basic elements. The, the fourth one is back and forth, which is where the child's initial action and the adult's reaction is then followed by an ongoing kind of back and forth between the two of them. And the very last one that we realized as we were kind of developing this and watching many hours of adult child interaction was that there are often instances where the child's attention will shift uh, or their behavior will shift from one activity to another. And when the adult follows the child, it's into that next focus or activity. It's really critical for signaling the transition and really an important thing for adults and children to do together. So those are the basic elements. Uh, the way that the, the uh, approach is constructed is that we go into the natural environment, the context of doing this with parents, do it in the home. We film for 15 or 20 minutes. It can be in the context of any other kind of home visiting activity. Um, we then bring the video uh, back to a central location. We extract the content, again, these micro social moments uh, from the video. So we're not having the clinician uh, do the, the, uh, the coaching by watching the entire film with the child. It's just a curated uh, set of, of clips that we've pulled out. And then we go back into the home uh, and we coach the parents using that film. Um, each of these coaching sessions is curated in the same way. So we start with an opening photo still shot that just shows a really lovely moment between adult and child. Um, we then show three clips. We provide a description of each clip. 
We show the clip through in its entirety. Again, that could just be a matter of seconds or half a minute. We then break it down into kind of a play-by-play -play like you'd see in sports. So we start it and stop it and narrate it. And then we show, we kind of reconstruct it and show it through its in, in its entirety. Uh, I recommend just kind of thinking about this because oftentimes when we watch something for the first time, especially when it's quick, it's really hard to pick up on all the details. So this process really is again, oriented to adult learning to be able to see the thing and see it broken down and then have it come back together. And I think people, um, really, it really helps people to understand what's in it. Um, each of the, the elements is coached in a separate session. So we first have a first visit, do filming, then we go out and coach on the first element, come, go back, do a second filming and so forth. Um, that's the standard model, uh, takes 10 sessions. We, we designed this again, this was some of the scalability that was intentional. We designed this um, to be able to allow us to do it at a, on an individual home visit basis. We've also done it in groups. Groups are especially helpful in the context of um, really high stress populations um, or those who might in benefit from the support of others. So like teen parenting groups has been one context where this has worked really well. Fathers groups, another one. Um, and then actually before the pandemic, we were already trying this on a web-based delivery um, approach works just as well. There are some really interesting things about if you're doing web-based, you don't have somebody in the home filming. And it turns out people's behavior is different when they're filming themselves versus when somebody's filming them. So there, there are some things to, to just to, to adapt in that context. Um, what have we found? Uh, basically, the results have been very promising. Again, especially given what a light touch approach this is. Um, so among the things that we found um, are increases in children's expressive language and their um, receptive language, auditory comprehension. Uh, that's from a recent RCT in an early Head Start context. It's a collaboration with Sarah Watamura. Um, and here you can see some of the results of, of just the, the um, model testing, the group assignment, and the extent to which we see these impacts. Um, we've also found many positive impacts on um, adult well-being. We have found consistently that the adults who benefit the most from the um, from this approach are those who often have low levels of self-efficacy um, or don't think of themselves as having very sort of well-developed parenting skills. Um, here you can see increases in the fine condition relative to a, a comparison uh, again in the same really head start RCT um, for self-efficacy. Um, you can see that again, this is the phenomenon that I noted, which is parents with higher levels of their own early life adversity tend to benefit more from this approach in terms of their self-efficacy. And we see main effect for parent sense of competence. We've done this uh, with, with a, a group of dads. This was a small scale RCT. That's a collaboration with Holly Schindler, um, Spanish speaking, largely Latin A dads um, in, uh, in Seattle. And again, seen changes in father's self-concept. Um, and then I talked a lot about children's brain functioning and brain development. Um, one of the studies that we did that's now led to a couple of subsequent large scale RCTs is examining changes in maternal brain functioning. You may mention, or may remember that I mentioned that one of the things we emphasize is waiting. And so uh, when we do a different task, not the flanker, but a task called the stop signal task, um, which really taps the ability to inhibit a behavioral response that you're uh, kind of pre-primed to deliver, um, we actually see that over the course of these five coaching sessions or 10 sessions total, we see that, uh, that moms in this small scale RCT um, showed increased behavioral performance. That is, they were able to withhold the behavioral response relative to a comparison group. And we see enhanced um, uh, brain activity in regions that are associated with motor control in that same group. So at least hypothetically, there's some possibility that this kind of naturalistic experience and practicing of waiting to respond to your child and this kind of back and forth interaction might actually help um, with self-regulation, at least behavioral self-regulation um, of the adults who are engaged. Um, I wanna just segue now uh, kind of away from the, the results of the parenting interventions to talk 
um, about sort of some general principles. So first and foremost, I think one of the things that, um, that we've sort of been misguided in as a field is the extent to which we privilege single approaches. So find, let's get find everywhere, as opposed to what are the ways to think about the mechanisms that, that again, might be trans-theoretical, uh, might cut across the variety of approaches that we employ um, that can make the biggest difference. And the reason that I started by talking about zeroing in on the building blocks is because really the nature of adult-child interaction is one common way to think about how to be effective, especially anything that's likely, any strategy that's likely to increase the sensitivity and responsiveness and predictability of the early caregiving environment. Uh, I would say at this point, and I think my team would say that these things have potential. And so rather than these kind of large scale omnibus programs, whatever your orientation or perspective and whatever population you're working with, the question might be, what are the, the things necessary to increase the likelihood of that sensitive, responsive caregiving happening? This is the results. Uh, this particular uh, citation is for the Reach Up program that was developed in Jamaica. Again, it's a home visiting program for parents. Um, uh, but in addition, uh, more recently, CPP, um, child parent psychotherapy, the techniques um, have been uh, adapted for use in large scale implementation in Colombia by my colleague, Andres Moya. And again, I think here you could think, well, this is a context where there are high levels of trauma and violence. And so uh, I think sort of consistent with the, the origins of CPP, the idea of needing to address trauma before you can address uh, the kind of responsive parenting is a, an equally important way to think about these things. It really is population and context dependent. And what it gets to is still thinking about mechanisms rather than throwing everything at the wall and hoping that something works. We think that if we really zero in on mechanisms, that that's where we're gonna begin to see broader and more population level impacts. Uh, the other thing I wanna note, especially in this context today is that we're increasingly seeing, um, and there may be work here at UCSF going on in this area, that where historically we've thought, well, in order to deliver programs that can make a difference, we need trained psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers. Uh, one of the, the lessons I think that's actually going in the reverse direction from what's been typical, which is programs being exported from the US elsewhere, is that concepts of community health workers, doulas, being able to be trained to deliver these services um, are now starting to show up as extensions of the physician's office um, in ways that are helping to address the shortage of staffing to really deliver these approaches. And when you have approaches that are largely descriptive, which FIND is, so you're just seeing what you say uh, as the person who's delivering the approach, then the potential to train doulas, community health workers who are trusted, trusted members of the community has the potential to get to individuals who might ordinarily not have as much access. Um, I also want to note, uh, and this is, I think, my final segue, because I know I've been veering in lots of directions, um, that I, I think we've also typically chosen sides about, well, is it the parenting environment? Or should we be thinking about the childcare context? Or, or should we only be thinking about uh, Head Start, because that's a, a national program that serves the largest number of kids. Uh, what I would say is that when you begin to zero in on these basic principles of human development, that you can develop approaches that apply equally well to the home and parent-child environment as you can to any caregiving environment. And that's important to us because we know we're not taking an ideological stance that children need to be at home with their parents in order to thrive and develop in a healthy way. Many parents want to work, many parents need to work. And so a large portion of our population of infants and toddlers is being cared for by people outside the home. If you don't need a completely separate suite of strategies and programs to support those who are taking care of children, whether it's parents or others, then again, you have much greater potential for larger scale impacts because you're really uh, developing approaches that can be implemented in a variety of contexts. So we've done this. Um, we have used 
uh, and implemented find in the context of home and center-based care environments, um, typically with coaches who support care providers to provide higher quality care. Um, and uh, th these are just a couple of photos. They would have been videos, but we couldn't get the sound working. Uh, very much how you can do the same kind of video, uh, kind of collecting video and showing these moments, not just with individual children, um, but I think one of the things that's made things a little more complicated in the care, early care environment is that the adult has to be doing these certain return interactions, playing with multiple kids, still very possible to do. Um, we have um, collaborated with colleagues at the University of Washington. Gail Joseph and her team did an independent RCT um, of the impacts of FIND in the context of home and center care-based environments. And again, saw increases in language increases, uh, language uses increases in uh, in toddlers' language development and in the conversational turns that were occurring uh, in the home. Lastly, um, I mentioned uh, at the outset that even though we had uh, endeavored to develop an approach with Find that was highly scalable, that didn't require the same level of knowledge and expertise that wasn't as expensive, um, that could be implemented by anybody, um, we ran into a number of bottlenecks. And I think this is another thing that I would strongly emphasize that we, I think we've gone a little bit off course historically, although it's starting to change in thinking that once a program has been developed and validated, that it, it's ossified, that it can't ever be anything other than what it was in part because it takes so many years to develop an evidence base that something is effective. But what that's done is to deprive us of what often happens elsewhere in other sectors, which is the idea of continuous improvement and in learning, especially about whether there are particular things that you're doing that are effective, others that are not. And then also in terms of segmenting the population so that you begin to understand who's benefiting and who isn't, uh, and then uh, can develop adaptive strategies in that context. Um, and so we've really taken seriously over the last 10 years or so that FINE's been around of the idea that you still need to do as rigorous research as, as always, that randomized clinical trials are still the gold standard. But number one, you should never rest on your laurels. Even if you have a program that works, you can still learn about it and make it better. Uh, and also that there are ways to, especially in the early phases of developing uh, a new program or bringing a program to a new population to optimize the strategies that you're using. We don't do the optimization phase in our sector nearly as much as we should. And so then you're kind of like rolling the dice once you've got this large scale trial going on. And that really inhibits the kind of learning that, it, that can occur. So as a result of this, um, we have really continued to consider what are the things that are limiting uh, the process of, of fine getting out there? What have we learned along the way? Um, and how can we adapt these approaches um, to get them more scalable, which has been one of our challenges? Um, one, one solution to this, which is specific to early care environments that are not the home environment, has been to develop a suite of professional development materials that don't require you to go and film in the natural environment, but that provide example clips of the kinds of interactions that are so supportive of development using the same format of showing them in their entirety, breaking them down and reconstructing them, but doing this in an online web-based approach that's asynchronous because we, we certainly have learned that early care providers can't oftentimes go to classes, don't have much more than a little bit of time here and there. And so the development of this uh, approach for the professional development context has been critical. Um, the other thing that we've been working a great deal on, um, and uh, I wanna go back to, just because again, I'm in the home where, where CPP developed. I remember having a conversation just as FIND was getting started with Alicia Lieberman, and we demonstrated what FIND was about. And she said, why would you spend all of those time, like all that time and resources editing films when you could be spending that time working with parents? And I, I took that stuck with me. The idea that resources are precious, 
that if any work that you're doing with parents involves taking time away from the parents, that it's an opportunity cost involved. And this has been something that's been on my mind, but also as FIND has really developed and has begun to scale, one of the things that we've seen is that the biggest bottleneck to producing the films isn't going into the home. The coaching is easy to train. And again, many, many people can do it. But the editing process takes a lot of time. So for a 10 to 15 minute film collected in the natural environment, a trained editor typically takes 45 minutes to an hour to edit a film. And that it has turned out to be uh, a challenge in terms of where's the expertise to do that. We have developed some hubs where we've trained editors who can handle large volume, um, but it also adds to expense. And so at the end of the day, it's sort of become a, 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 an aversive thing for, um, for agencies and systems to adopt when there's this big piece of it. From the get-go, we've been hearing from people um, that, uh, that uh, artificial intelligence will solve this problem. Um, but 10 years ago, artificial intelligence and the ability to solve this problem was like a pipe dream. Everybody talked about it, nobody knew how to do it. Um, but uh, we're actually working on it now. And it turns out that, um, that innovations in computer vision are really going a long way uh, to make this happen. So um, there are increasingly um, algorithms and uh, models that are developed and that are open access um, that will allow you to extract things like body pose, prosody, so the, the tone that's being used, as well as to automatically transcribe the language. And what we're doing, uh, we have a postdoc who trained in computer science, actually worked in Pat Levitt's um, child development research lab. So she's very got very interested in parent-child attachment, but she's a brilliant AI machine learning expert. Um, and she's come and has been working with us on how you might extract using these machine learning paradigms by looking at body pose. So are people facing each other? Uh, the, the directions of their gaze, is their gaze overlapping? What does their language sound like? What are they saying? In that context, what we've been able to do uh, is really identify the instances that a machine learning solution thinks are these moments that we then wanna break down into smaller pieces. And one of the things that's really interesting about these approaches is that once you begin the process of modeling, the more data you can feed back in of the correctly labeled instances the better you, the, the machine learning paradigm becomes at selecting these things. So it's this virtuous cycle. Um, already we've reduced the amount of time it takes to, to edit a film by about 20%. Um, and, and these algorithms are proving to be highly accurate. We think that we'll continue to get better and better. And eventually we really think that we won't need a team of editors, that the, the practitioner will be able to film, will get five or six suggestions of things will say, I want them to start here and stop there. And then again, the models will segment and add labels to the, to the film. Um, and this is no longer a pipe dream of like years and millions and millions of dollars. These things are becoming really at our fingertips. And again, um, somebody like Lauren Klein, who's our postdoc has specialized skills, but there are increasingly large numbers of people who are trained in how to use computer vision and who can access these things. Um, so, I just want to finish here um, and uh, and just make one or two concluding comments, and we have a little bit of time for questions. I think um, what I've been trying to, to indicate uh, is first and foremost that the field has potential to move forward. Um, our ability to to really help children under conditions of stress, um, even milder forms of stress and extreme forms, be able to develop. Uh, in ways that lead to academic achievement, to social emotional development, to economic self-sufficiency in the long run, and to avoid many of the health risks that we see yeah, are, is really within our grasp. But if we shift away from thinking about that we need to throw the kitchen sink into these social programs in order to have the impacts and really use a mechanism-driven approach, and then if we invoke these iterative strategies that allow us to assume that we need to make things better and better over time, I feel very optimistic 
uh, that the field will develop. And I, I'm, I'm relieved to see that we're no longer as much haggling over which program is best um, or which methodology is best, but that there really is a confluence around defining adversity in much broader terms, uh, around thinking about unifying strategies that we can employ and about thinking about scale at the same time that we're thinking about impact uh, so that we can really move things forward. So I'll stop there. I think we have like nine minutes for Q&A. Thank you guys can see why I love him. Um, questions, Brian? Get my cardio for the day. <laughs> Stair climber. Yes. Thank you for a great talk and for your wonderful work. I have a question about the um, elements of the FIND program and whether each of them is equipotent in terms of contributing to the active ingredient of the program as a whole. And secondarily, over the course of the videos that you're seeing, if there's one of those elements that a family seems to have particular need of coaching around, does that trump the, we're gonna to touch on each five in turn? It's a great question. In part, uh, the I think one of the things that you observed is that it's not that the elements are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. And I think that's one difference from say, microsocial coding approaches where you wanna develop something where if it's this, it can't be that. Um, it's really more hierarchical and sequential. Um, so, you know, at a basic level, uh, the very first element, which is sharing the child's focus, is like a precondition without which the others can't occur. Uh, I, I do think that one of the questions that remains to be resolved is how do you know when an adult is paying attention? And are there uh, cultural differences in terms of whether an adult has to be looking at a child or have their body oriented to, that to them to know that they're paying attention? Um, so I, I just want to put that disclaimer in. Um, Really the back and forth interaction, and by the way, this is not a, an analysis of, of each of the elements, which I think is a really interesting question and which ones seem to have the sort of the biggest return. Um, but the back and forth is really sort of the, the core proto element. That is to say, sorry, not back and forth, supporting encouragement. That is to say that to the extent that adult has mapped onto a child and in some way indicated that they're seeing them, that they're hearing them, that they're acknowledging them. The, if, if parents are doing that, a lot of other things follow. The use of, of words to name is just an extension of supporting and encouragement where the adult is using words specifically to name the child's action or emotion. Um, and the others are like sort of, you know, level two. That is, if you're going back and forth after the initial one, if you're following the child's attention into something else, those are really things that if you're not, again, you want to be doing those, but they're not, they're not things that are critical to get the, the process starting. So as a, as a sort of intuition, I would say that the, the supporting and encouragement is really the core. Uh, and, but again, it's an empirical question of whether you might be able to do just that uh, and, and not have all of these other pieces uh, in, in order to produce the same kind of results. Did that, did I answer your question? Okay. Got a question over here and then I'll check with Gina to see if the online audience. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Really interesting talk. Um, it's wonderful to see that you're using the ML methods to analyze the videos, uh, in light of your point about, you know, wanting to iterate and continually improve on these methods. Um, can you use the videos to try and identify things that you didn't intuitively think were important in the videos to kind of validate the things you imposed initially in your assumptions and really kind of iterate the initial assumptions? So it's a great question. This is sort of more from the like data science AI world, which is like maybe there are things that are happening in the interactions that are driving children's development that we haven't looked at, like the the children's eye saccades. If you could, if you could look at, at, if you had a, you know, an eye tracker and you could look at how much the child's eyes are moving, like maybe that would be driving it. The answer is ultimately, I'm sure that that can happen. The, um, one of the, the challenges that we face right now is 
in labeling the phenomena that we're most interested in. And so in that sense, if we're not bound by like this particular thing that we've identified, now we need the, the uh, models to be able to identify reliably, but rather what are the things in the vast amount of data that exists that might be driving outcomes. I think the potential exists to do that. Part of the question is what are you looking for in terms of outcomes? So what are the things? So you, I, we're seeing this kind of work being done in autism research where there may be things that are predictive of, uh, of uh, the development of autis, autism uh, spectrum disorder symptoms that you might be able to detect very early in terms of just having a child look at a computer screen. Um, so I think that's sort of a direction that things can go. Um, and, and there are a lot of questions about where do you start? Do you start with, with the phenomena that you're interested in and try to tra entrain that? Or do you start with things that might be entirely a theoretical? And that's, that's the downside is, you know, is there any meaning to these phenomena? Are they trainable? Uh, but certainly a viable other way into the, to the approach. Yeah. One somewhat quick question from the online community from Kevin is asking about our kids aware they're being filmed and how might that affect the process or, or their interactions? So kids are aware they're being filmed. Parents are aware that they're being filmed. Uh, and child care providers, obviously, when we do it in the context uh, of care. Um, what we have found is that, um, first of all, one question that often comes up is like, do people object? Um, are people uncomfortable? Do they feel like they're going to be judged? And I think it, the, the fact that we're showing positive instances um, really helps get past that. We're, we start by saying we're going to show you things that, um, that you know, are really great things that you're doing that help to promote kids' development. The question of um, how kids react, I mentioned earlier that we have detected that when parents film themselves versus when there's somebody in the home filming, we actually see less uh, interaction happening in the self-filming context. Um, and we've wondered about that because if somebody's not there, uh, somebody, a stranger or a person unfamiliar isn't there, why might there be less behavior? Um, and I was saying right before we started, I was remembering the instances during the pandemic when you had to give a talk by recording yourself beforehand and then like it would be shown to an audience. And I, I do think there's a level of self-consciousness when there's no audience. Um, so it could actually be that the the environment in which you're just doing it yourself elicits le less behavior. Um, we do not see kids get particularly distracted. They adapt very quickly, uh, as do adults. I think there, there may be a little bit of people being on good behavior, but that's just fine because we're trying to show instances of sub developmentally supportive behavior. So if people are, even if it's they're ratcheting it up or they're, they're trying to do things that they think would be expected, showing them that those are the good things has potential to be positive. And then lastly, I'll say, when we do the coaching sessions in the home, kids love to watch them. So, you know, we intended to just coach parents and have the kids off somewhere else or with a, another adult or a sibling. Um, kids always want to see it. So there are these lovely moments in coaching sessions where the child's up on the parent's lap and the coach is explaining to the, to the parent, the child's pointing at the screen, uh, where it really, I think, redoubles some of the, the relational stuff that we want to see happen. Yes, well, we're at time. There are some other great questions in the chat we didn't have time to get to, sorry. But um, please join me in thanking Dr. Fisher for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you for, thank, thanks to those of you who, you know, braved the weather to come. And thanks to people who dialed in online.